Captain on the Line, which is, comes out on Sunday morning. Rabbi Potasnik, he's the, uh, the rabbi for the fire department. And he had a question some b a while back to discuss Allah, 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 and God. And he said, I won't get into that subject. We won't discuss it. Um, the, the Muslims believe in Allah, but Rabbi Potasnik would not, would not compare anything. Uh, would you care to mention anything? At, uh, yeah, I, when, when I did before, I'll do now also. Uh, oh, Allah is taken from them from Alaka. Alaka, which is, we use that word all the time. We have the same God as the Arabs. We believe in the same God, in one God. So it's a paradox. See, the Christians believe in the uh, Trinity, the, you know, the, the, whatever that's supposed to mean. But it's a part of it is their, their God, who's the JC, we call him. But uh, <laughs> that, so that's uh, not our belief at all. We, we're not allowed to believe in anything like that. And we're in better terms with the Christians generally than with the Arabs, generally speaking. But we have in common, we believe in the same God. As a matter of fact, I was speaking once to Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, the greatest rabbi of our generation. He said, Allah, that's the Arab's, Arab's God, the same God that we have. He wasn't afraid to talk about it. They have the same God. But a lot of them, I feel embarrassed by it because a lot of them, the way they act with the terrorism and so on, it's so anti what God wants. So I'm, I'm sure they're not all like that, but a lot of them that, that, that are very... Uh, um, terroristic and uh, out for blood and very uh, mean and ruthless uh, to, to, to us that's, uh, that's embarrassing that we have the same God but that's not what God wants people, how people to act I'm sure a lot of them are embarrassed from themselves also the Arabs the way some of them act but uh, generally speaking they took upon themselves the, the real God of the world the creator they also believe in the Old Testament because they have their own uh, Koran, what they believe in, I don't know what that says over there exactly. Just like the Christians have the New Testament, they have their New Testament called the Koran, but they believe in the Old Testament too. And they change history around. The problem is that they, we know that Abraham took Isaac for a sacrifice. No, he took Ishmael for a sacrifice. They changed the whole thing around the last uh, few hundred years when from heaven and the prophet came from heaven, who also uh, uh, preached God, that he didn't make himself into a God. He preached there was a God in the world, and, and he was a prophet, but he changed things around in the Torah to make the Arabs like they're on top, and the Jews are on the bottom, they're on top, whatever it is. But Allah means God, Alokah, that we say, and uh, they believe in the one God who created the world. What, was there an so event? I don't exactly why Rabbi why he was afraid to discuss it, I don't know. Was there an event that made the Muslims break away and change the name of God to whatever? Didn't change the name of God. It's, uh, Allah, that's the name of the God. Was, man. What, they didn't break away from any. Why did they break away? They, they, they come from the children of Abraham, of Yishmael. We come from Yitzchak, and they come from Yishmael. But God made the covenant with us, not with him. He made the covenant with Yitzchak, not with Yishmael. Now they come along years later and say, no, he made the covenant with us. <laughs> they, they're was trying to change it around. for them to suddenly get a reward for killing them. So well, did anything happen no, we're not worldwide? We're not, we don't have any mitzvah to kill the Arabs. We don't have mitzvah to kill the Arabs. No, no I mean the reward that they get. Who gets? The Jews or the Arabs? No, the Arabs. Get a seven virgins or seven oh, that's their That's their, that's their oh, things. That's, that's what, nothing to do with Judaism. They just woke up one day and they had a whole script well, I'm sure that it, it evolved over the years, all these type of things, and what they, what they, uh, all these <laughs> lot of silly things that they have. But, uh, uh, but Mohammed, he, he, he had the Koran, I guess, has a lot of stuff in the Koran, that that's their, that's their Bible, the Koran. They believe in the Old Testament, but they also believe in the Koran, which he, which he wrote. Uh, yeah, so I'm sure a lot of these things... Well, that's why Rabbi Potasnik said, I, I won't... Do you ever listen to him? Uh, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, don't know him. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, I'm sure. I, mean, I guess he had a reason why he didn't want to talk about it. But I don't know exactly uh, why not. 
Um, but have I answered your question? Yes, sir. What would happen if I sent my pet lizard DNA into 23andMe? And so with the help of my wife, we extracted enough saliva to send off in the mail. We were so excited to see the results. After about three months, we were shocked. My lizard was 51% Ashkenazi Jewish. He was also 48% West Asian. This was really interesting. They also gave us a little bit of his background and his history. What he liked to eat. That's not what's going on. They didn't just carve up the topography of Africa or the geography of Africa, the soil of Africa, but they also carved and divided and robbed and stole the ideas of Africa. We call that going to museums where we have to now pay to look at the works that our ancestors wrote, to look at the works that our ancestors left in the world. We're now going into museums and we're now forced to pay for that which our ancestors freely left in the world. This is a great atrocity among our people today. But it's only when we reconnect with those ideas that the bridge begins to build itself and unites us with our African foundation and base. There's something that I often do when I also do my tours. I'm a tour guide at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And in my tours, of which I've done now 30 plus tours, there's one particular exhibit that draws a lot of attention. It's a Dogon exhibit. The Dogon people are very, very brilliant and intelligent people. The Dogon tribe, they studied the stars. Their knowledge of astrology led to the current academic consensus on astronomy. I have to say it again. The Dogon study of astrology helped to pave the way for the current academic consensus on astrology. Why is that important? One of the things you learn in any academia hall, especially as you merge into college, is that the forerunner of astronomy is astrology. The people who studied astrology, they build the intellectual framework for the science we refer to today as astronomy, of which the Dogon were a very important part of doing and laying down. But there's a particular exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum which is highly special. The Dogon have an oral tradition which says that there's a time in their ancestral lineage where human beings lost their way and the god of the world destroys the world and only keeps eight people alive. They have an ark in the form of a horse which replicates the same teaching which comes out of the Bible. There are many people walking around and are simply relegating the Bible to a fanciful mythology or story, not realizing why the aim of the Bible is not to be a history book. The aim is to be a moral guide. That's why we don't find great chronology. That's why we don't find many dates. That's why there are so many missing details. If the aim and goal of the book is not to be a history book, then it will not behave as such. Doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't have history, but the aim, purpose, and goal is not to tell a historical story. Its aim and purpose is to use various parts of history as a moral guide. When you understand that, the Bible not having dates won't bother you. The purpose, aim, and goal is to be a moral guide, not a history book. If you want dates, you have to go into the academic record, which is referred to as the historical record. But if you want to understand morality, then the Bible becomes powerful. So the Dogon take a surviving tale, which we only find in the Bible, that speaks of eight people surviving a great flood. But the peoples of Dogon, the Dogon tribe, are memorializing the same thing that the Bible spoke of. Isn't this African history? So how can we separate the Bible from African history when we see various parts of the narrative of the Bible being retold right now on the continent of Africa? And that's powerful. The masks we're looking at are made by the Dogon people of Mali. 
The Dogon people make 78 different kinds of masks, all of them very, very arresting and striking and uh, awesome. This is a Kanaga mask, but it's only part of a Kanaga mask. It's a fragment. It represents a bird, the bustard bird, uh, with a very big wing spread. And notice the dynamic quality of this face. This is a bird's beak. If you look at this, uh, it might remind you not only of a bird, but of a man and of an animal as well. And that's what the Dogon meant when they make this. It's kind of a synthesis of those three creatures. If I turn it sideways, The main difference between sirens and mermaids is that sirens have a human face on a bird body while a mermaid has a human face on a fish body. Sirens are only found in Greek mythology whereas mermaids are found in Greek mythology and many other folklore and myths. The dynamic quality of this face. This is a bird's beak. If you look at this, uh, it might remind you not only of a bird, but of a man and of an animal as well. And that's what the Dogon meant when they make this. It's kind of a synthesis of those three creatures. If I turn it sideways, you see how large and sharp the nose is. It has a very high dome-like forehead. And on all Kanaga masks, the mouth is a cone. And notice these holes. Sticks are inserted in these holes and they come out holes on the other side. Those are for bite sticks because the man who wears, I should say, dances this mask, holds onto the mask with his teeth. He clenches his teeth on that bite stick and that's what holds it up. You notice the traces of black. That's pigment. This is an old example, a very fine one. It has been danced. It is real. Uh, but a lot of the paint has worn off. These are the eye holes through which the dancer looks. You have to imagine the pupils of an eye moving behind there and a big superstructure above, and we'll see that in a minute. African masks, for me anyway, are endlessly fascinating. They tend to conform to a type from a given style region, but within that, there are very important, very significant differences from carver to carver, from area to area, from dancer to dancer. These three are Kanaga masks. They're among the most spectacular masks in Africa. They represent the bustard, a large bird, similar to the crane or the plover, uh, which is native to Africa as well as Asia. This is the part that goes over the dancer's face. Represent the bustard, a large bird, similar to the crane or the plover, uh, which is native to Africa as well as Asia. This is the part that goes represent the bustard, a large bird, similar to the crane or the plover, uh, which is native to Africa as well as Asia. This is the part that goes over the dancer's face, and this rope, netted rope arrangement, goes over the back of his head. Notice the stick right here, going through holes in either side of the mask. Uh, it is placed so that the dancer can clench his teeth on it, and that's what holds the mask on, in addition to the netting that goes over the back of his head. There's that sharp nose that we noticed on the fragments, and there is the cone-shaped mouth. But when we come along to the front, we see the projecting ears on the top of the box. It's always a box type shape with rectangular eyes, but up here are what appear to be the legs of an animal. But they are not the legs of an animal, they represent the wings of the bird. Most African sculpture, masks, figure sculptures, whatever we're looking at, 
is made of one piece of wood. This is made of more than one piece of wood. Uh, the members of the wings, the better parts of the wings, are made separately and lashed together. One, two, three, four, five, six, and fastened to the main body of the mast with leather tongs. The mast Strong Strong's H eighty three fourteen Saraf Saraf Seraph Seraph, seraphim majestic beings with six wings, human hands or voices in attendance upon God. Six wings. Six wings. Six wings. Oh my God! The Tongata Manu, bird man, from Tongata, human beings, plus Manu, bird, one, was the winner of a traditional competition on Rapa Nui, Easter Island. The ritual was an annual competition to collect the first sooty tern, Manu Tara, egg of the season from the islet of Motu Nui. Swim back to Rapa Nui and climb the sea cliff of Rano Kau to the clifftop village of Orongo. Birdmen, Tongata Manu, paintings in the so-called Cannibal Cave, In the Rapa Nui mythology, the deity Make Make was the chief god of the Birdman cult, and the other three deities associated with it were Hawa II Take Take, the chief of the eggs, a male god. His wife Vi Wa, and another female deity named Vi Kenetia. Each of these four also had a servant god who was associated with them. The names of all eight would be chanted by contestants during the various rituals preceding the egg hunt. Contestants, all men of importance on the island, were revealed in dreams by Iviatuas or prophets, who might be either men or women, two, each contestant would then appoint one or sometimes two hopu, other adult men of lesser status, who would actually swim to Motu Nui carrying provisions in a bundle of reeds called a pour under one arm and await the arrival of the turns. Hoping to return with the first egg, while their tribal sponsors, the contestants, waited at the stone village of Orongo. The race was very dangerous and many hopu were killed by sharks, by drowning, or by falling from cliff faces, though replacements were apparently easily available. 3. 262. Once the first egg was collected, the finder would go to the highest point on Motu Nui and call out to the shore of the main island, announcing his benefactor by that benefactor's new name and telling him, go shave your head. You have got the egg. The cry would be taken up by listeners at the shoreline who would pass it up the cliffside to the contestants waiting in the stone village. 
The unsuccessful Hopu would then collectively swim back to the main island while the egg finder would remain on Motu Nui and would fast alone until he swam back, which he would do with the egg secured inside a reed basket tied to his forehead. On his reaching land, he would then climb the steep, rocky cliff face and, if he did not fall, present the egg to his patron Dael, who would have already shaved his head and painted it either white or red. This successful contestant, not the Hopu, would then be declared Tongata Manu, would take the egg in his hand and lead a procession down the slope of Rano Kau to Anakina if he was from the western clans or Rano Raraku if he was from the eastern clans. The new Tongata Manu was entitled to gifts of food and other tributes, including his clan Dael having sole rights to collect that season's harvest of wild bird eggs and fledglings from Motu Nui, and went into seclusion for a year in a special ceremonial house. Once in residence there he was considered tapu, sacred, for the next five months of his year-long status and allowed his nails to grow and wore a headdress of human hair. He would spend his time eating and sleeping, and would be expected to engage in no other activity. 3. 263 The Birdman cult was suppressed by Christian missionaries in the 1860s. 4. The origin of the cult and the time of it are uncertain. As it is unknown whether the cult replaced the preceding Moai-based religion or had coexisted with it. Catherine Routledge was, however, able to collect the names of 86 Tongata Manu, 3. human face on a bird body while a mermaid has a human face on a fish body. Sirens are only found in Greek mythology whereas mermaids are found in Greek mythology and many other folklore and myths. YouTube, Static in the Attic. I recently spent the last couple weekends out in Anza Borrego Desert here because what can I say, I'm a man obsessed. I am constantly on the truth for knowledge and not just knowledge of the world around me, but also knowledge of myself. And I think that is the greatest understanding any of us are ever going to achieve. But so I went out searching for these three different petroglyph sites out there that were actually really hard to find. And nobody online with two, uh, two of these sites would even tell you exactly where they are, which made it a lot of fun and a lot of Indiana Jones for me, so I'm not going to tell exactly how to get to these sites. I'll give you guys the general area, but I'm going to try to make this a little more exciting exciting than Aunt Flo's vacation in Cabo pictures, and we'll go over some of the real history of Native Americans and sky watching, because this is a practice that is old as time, and everybody has always watched the heavens especially out here in the desert, because there's really nothing more to look at than <laughs> the sky at night. But I, I honestly think that these petroglyphs are portraying an event from just a few hundred years ago. So let's start with the basics on things and we'll work up to that. I'm going to preface this next bit by saying that I am not a fan of the ancient aliens theory, but there is something to all of that. They bring up valid points, and we do have evidence of advanced technology all around the world, and I hate to use the word technology because we're talking about something we really don't understand. For all I know, this could have been telepathy, a type of poured concrete, sound and resonant frequencies, a geopolymer, as in it was grown. I simply don't know, and I'm one of the few on here that will just say when I don't know something, instead of fighting tooth and nail to defend a position that should have been abandoned long ago. You see it all over academia and all over YouTube. When you're wrong, just say you're wrong and move on. 
So the fact is, we don't know how these ancient megaliths were built. We don't even know what happened to the people or things that built them. And historians and archaeologists just to choose choose to ignore their existence altogether. But we have a very rich anthropological record all around the world of culture saying that they are descended from the sky or from star people, as some of the terminologies put it. So while I'm not a fan of the little green men, there's still questions in this area that definitely deserve answers. So uh, me personally, I look at at it from the perspective of as below, as above, so below. And no, I'm not a Freemason. If I did, I could probably drop some more knowledge on that than I actually can at this point. But I look at it as the possibility of, are we spiritually linked to the billions of stars in the sky? Something along that line, a type of dual creation to where as the star pops popped into existence, your spirit, your essence popped into existence. Because we have what would be considered primitive cultures all around the world saying the same thing. The Dogon over in Africa saying they're from the stars. The Inca even said that each tribe down in modern day Peru down there were descended from a different star or a dif different constellation. So with all of that being said, I want to get into some of the Native American tribes of all melanated varieties that actually lived here. And these guys lived here for hundreds of years outside of the Native American tribes of all melanated varieties that actually lived here. And these guys lived here the Native American tribes of all melanated varieties that actually lived here. And these guys lived here for hundreds of years outside of the influence of Europeans. I don't like it when people start confusing the timelines and just making everything a jumbled mess. It is very clear that the Native Americans lived in this country free from European influence for hundreds of years. The descendants of these people still live here in reservations all over this country. The Aztecs, yeah, they all died out for some mysterious reason. There ah. are still descendants of the Incas and anthropologists have worked with these cultures for a long time trying to understand them. I have personally been to TP peyote ceremonies on reservation land and guys these guys have been here for hundreds of years it really does make me angry when people start denying that fact prior to what i am thinking was the event of about 700 years ago could have been as soon as 500 years ago things were very different in america i do believe we have all of the legends of red-haired giants that did carry through until relatively recent times but there may have been many more of them back in the day we also have the ancient canal builders down in louisiana somebody had to do all of that so there was definitely a worldwide culture in my mind at some point but that ended i believe because of catastrophes and there was at least a period of hundreds of years before the Europeans and the Americans were back in contact with each other. So there was a period of a couple hundred years where the two intermingled and then the events of 1812 era happened. Again, catastrophes, year without summer, and that's when you saw Manifest Destiny and the European takeover of the Americas. I, I really do think all of our history is connected through repeating cyclical catastrophes okay back to the point of the video the sky i'm sorry i really felt like those things needed to be said so you're looking at a deer skin here of the pawnee indians they were known as the sky watchers let me read you this article while you're checking that out ancient people have watched the sky since the beginning of time and many cultures establish myths and legends associated with the celestial bodies they observe in the night sky 
Still, our understanding of meteors was rather primitive when the 1833 Leonid meteor storm occurred in North America. This unusually bright and plentiful meteor shower left most people in America, most of the people in the United States from white European settlers to African slaves to Native Americans quaking in fear, certain that they were experiencing the end of time. Only one Native American tribe, the Pawnees, not only predicted the meteor shower, but they celebrated it. The shower of falling stars is created by space debris from the Temple Tuttle Comet that strikes the Earth's atmosphere, so they say. But every 33 years, here we go with 33s again, the Leonid storm, the comet's orbit takes it closer to the Earth and therefore spawns many more meteors. 1833 fell on that 33-year cycle when the meteor shower stormed. While many cultures observed the annual meteor shower and could predict its arrival from year to year, the Pawnee Indians of the American Plains were one of the only groups of people that knew about the 33-year cycle of the comet they will not get over, and this is in 1833. Using their star charts, the Pawnee, dubbed the Star Watchers, knew that the 1833 Leonids would be special and they awaited their arrival. Oh my God, I could, I could barely read that with all of the 33s in there. So, okay, bottom line is the Pawnee knew that this cycle happened. And so while all of the Europeans over in the Americas were freaking out, thinking that the world was ending, because all the stars are falling out of the sky. These guys were having a party watching the show. Now, this article from ancientpages.com, which I will leave all of these links in the description box, says that the Pawnee were familiar with meteorites. They had their own sky observation methods and followed the track of the sun, moon, and the five planets. They deeply believed that they were once born of the stars and were able, able to map their favored stars on buckskin. They mention the ancient five planets here, and I want to go into that a little bit. And I will say thank you to Ryan's Ranger for the email uh, reminding me to bring this up because I've only mentioned this stuff in passing about the electric universe and. Don't ever ask me. What and a, a lot of things. And guys, I'm going to be perfectly honest here. I get in trouble every time I talk about anything in the sky from flat earthers and I'm going to say straight out that guys, I don't know. I've looked into it a lot. I will say this. I have a big problem with the cosmology that we are given. I'll leave a link to wise up channels video that he did this recently, but I did this experiment a long, long time ago to with the angle of the earth and the angle of the sun and looking at how the sun would rise at the autumn equinox as opposed to the spring equinox and it doesn't work out so i have problems with the cosmology but due to what the flat earth movement has become everybody acts like the sky doesn't exist and i truly believe that you're going to find a lot of answers in the skies because this was very important to ancient people for some reason why did they pay so much attention to what was going on in the stars so the ancient five planets are found universally throughout all cultures. And they're these little specks of light up in the sky, but they held big meaning to ancient people. So if you are not familiar with the Thunderbolts project, there will be a link to that video in the description as well. Um, according to their cosmology here, the, the ancient five planets are the Earth, Mars, Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter, and they were all in a straight line centered over the North Pole. So I'm not, I'm not saying that I agree or disagree with this. I think it is something that everyone should look into uh, as well as Emmanuel Velikovsky, um, Worlds in Collision. Um, something, there, there's definitely things in our past, which I'm gonna get more into in, in future videos. The only problem here with the, the five ancient planets of the Thunderbolts project is According to my research, Mercury was one of the five ancient planets as well, not, they didn't include Earth, so a little discrepancy there. So, the Pawnee sky map gives no indication of the importance of the path of the sun, the ecliptic, or the sol summer solstice. Also, they did not bother to develop 
any precise lunar calendar, most ancient cultures, including other North American Indian tribes, had calendars calculated with the summer solstice, solstice uh, or the moon, or even lunar solar events. We, we see this everywhere. Stonehenge, and due to the severe droughts this year, I have seen two similar Stonehenge type structures that have emerged from the water because the water level dropped so far that these old structures you know you, you know could be seen again so everybody has a long history of keeping up with the sky but it is pretty interesting that these guys really don't give any importance to the sun or the moon in their observations now let's look at cultural memories of some of the other North American tribes a Lakota legend speaks of seven maidens being chased by a bear. On their knees, they prayed for divine intervention, the result being that the ground beneath them erupted high into the air, lifting them out of harm's way as the bear clawed at the risen ground. The result was Devil's Tower, Wyoming, the bear's claw having carved vertical geological features into the rock and the seven maidens having been installed above the Pleiades. I personally see an ancient tree here and everybody should definitely be checking out Roger's work over at Mud Fossils. But this is the Lakota having a relationship with the Pleiades. And guys, out in the desert, when Orion comes up, Orion's belt is pointing up at the top of the bow. And then you, you can make this line up to the Pleiades. Whoa, man, the stars are brilliant at night out in the desert and I mean Orion looks like it is just there. So the Hopi believe their ancestors came from the Pleiades as well. The place or people they call Chihukan or those who cling together a reference it seems to that tightly grouped starry cluster as it appears to the naked eye. Likewise early Dakota with a D not Lakota Dakota legends speak of the Pleiades as the abode of the ancestors, and other native oral histories or legends speak of an origin, if not in the Pleiades, then in the stars generally or other constellations. The Cree, for example, arrived on Earth from the stars as spirits and then became human beings. So, like I said, I'm not a huge fan of the ancient aliens theory on things, but, guys, we got a lot, a lot of cultural histories that mention that we come from the stars so there's something to all this other native legends including those of the Lakota speak not necessarily of star people but of mysterious beings coming from above as spheres of light that in turn abduct children so there is a long history of the phenomena we still have going on of the UFO abduction cases something is going on whether it's technology or if it's some energy or power that's creating a sphere of light i i don't know but we do have histories of these things going on so let's jump over to the other side of the world and talk about the dogon you guys have probably heard of the dogon tablets this from unmuseum.org Org, the Dogon are believed to be of Egyptian descent and their astronomical lore goes back thousands of years to 3200 BC. Official. I know they said Egyptian, but I often wonder if they were of the Babylonian descent. Because how come you have a tribe called Dogon and you have a fish, the deity that's worshipped in Babylon, who's spelled the same way? Dating. According to their traditions, the star Sirius has a companion star which is invisible to the human eye. This companion star has a 50-year elliptical orbit around the visible Sirius and is extremely heavy. It also rotates on its axis. Yeah, yeah. The legend might be of little importance to anybody but the two French anthropologists who recorded it from Dogon priests in the 1930s of little interest except that it is exactly true. How did a people who lack any kind of astronomical devices know so much about an invisible star? The star, which scientists call Sirius B, wasn't even photographed until it was done by a large telescope in the 1970s. So these guys have a history going back thousands of years 
that say that they are from a star that that even with modern equipment that's not what they said they didn't say they were from the stars they say the namu the ones that came and taught them are from the stars they were already living here on earth and they were visited by these things so that whole we're from the stars stuff is a load of trash we are just now able to realize that there are two stars there Sirius A and Sirius B the Dokon stories explain that also according to their oral traditions a race of people from the Sirius system called the Namos visited Earth thousands of years ago the Namos were ugly amphibious beings that resembled mermen and mermaids they also appear in Babylonian Akkadian and Sumerian myths the Egyptian goddess Isis, who is sometimes depicted as a mermaid, is also linked with the star Sirius. I don't know. Hey, maybe we did show up here on spaceships. Anyway, I find all of this very, very important because let's run down this whole Dogon story from the ancient times up until now because Dagon, I'm sorry I keep saying Dogon in place of Dagon, Dagon the god was an ancient Canaanite god. And in earlier mythology, the companion of Dagon was known as Belatu, meaning lady. Other mythologies associate him with the goddess Nanshi, who was a deity of fertility and fishing and the child of Enki, if you guys have heard of Enki from the Sumerian tablets. Hey everybody, Chad Perkins here with you from Kite Lingers. Sumerian tablets. So these guys are all related. Now here's the very interesting thing about the god Dagon is he was always represented with this fish on his head and this has filtered all the way down to the modern day version of the Pope's mitre. This all ties together. This is why I think there are a lot of answers to be found by looking into the stars. Now this Dagon false god is the same god talked about in the Bible in Samuel chapter 5 2 here. It says when the priest took the ark of God they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both of the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that <coughs> come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. I can't help but notice the similarities between carrying the wife over the threshold after marriage, you know, newlyweds. But I was looking into the Catholic Church traditions of anything to do with the threshold and I didn't find anything on that. But in my honest opinion, I would think that the Catholic Church has definitely been infiltrated and persuaded by the ancient priests of Dagon here because the Pope still wears the mitre, the fish's head of this ancient Canaanite god that was always portrayed with a fish on his head that fell down twice when the Ark of the Covenant was in the room with it. That is a subject that definitely deserves its own video or 10. Let's get back over here to America and I'll read you this quote from a Hopi elder, Dan Ivhama. Now we are at the very end of our trail. Many people no longer recognize the true path of the Great Spirit. They have in fact no respect for the Great Spirit or for our precious Mother Earth who gives us all life. We are instructed in our ancient prophecy that this would occur. Now, the Hopi prophecy indicates that three worlds have now passed. We are into the fourth world where we are about to enter the fifth world based on the timing disclosed by the nine signs. 
and the nine signs are as follows. The arrival of white-skinned men who take the land that is not theirs and strike their enemies with thunder, otherwise known as guns. Also, like I said, there was a period of time of hundreds of years where the Native Americans were here alone in America before the Europeans came over. It could have been hundreds of years or up to thousands of years since the worldwide cut culture and everybody was in touch with each other. So other of the nine signs is the coming of the spinning wheels filled with voices, covered wagons, a strange beast like buffalo but with long horns and enlarged numbers, herds of cattle. The land is crossed by snakes of iron, railroad tracks. The land is crossed by a giant spider's web, telephone and power lines. The land is crossed with rivers of stone, concrete and asphalt roads. The sea turns black, killing many things, oil spills, and many young people will wear their hair long like our people and visit tribal lands to learn our ways and wisdom. And the last of the nine signs saying that we were moving into the fifth world says a dwelling place in the heavens above earth appearing as a blue star crashes into mother earth signifying the end times the blue star is also called a kachina a supernatural spirit being this return of the blue star kachina who is known as nango shao will be the alarm clock that tells us of the new day and the new way of life a new world that is coming this is where the changes will begin. They will start as fires and burn within us, and we will burn up with desire and conflict if we do not remember the original teachings and return to the peaceful way of life. I would say that most of us feel these internal changes taking place right now. I know things have definitely changed for me. I used to be like clockwork to where in the springtime, I would just be buzzing with energy. That was my creative time. It was me just everything. The Odin tribes. All origin stories begin with gods who came from the sky, created humans, then left promising to return one day. They go by various names and descriptions often linked to ancient aliens. There seems to be a pattern with all of this found in oral traditions, petroglyphs, ceramics and other art forms ancient star maps, and other artifacts. Most myths depict gods meeting with primitive humans, their agendas varying. The precise origin of the Dogen, like those of many other ancient cultures, is linked to the Namo. Their civilization emerged, in much the same manner as most ancient civilizations. Because of these inexact and incomplete sources, there are a number of different versions of the Dogen's origin myths as well as differing accounts of how they got from their ancestral homelands to the Bandiagra region. The people call themselves Dogen or Dogem, but in the older literature they are most often called Hob, a full B word meaning stranger or pagan. The religious beliefs of the Dogen are enormously complex and knowledge of them varies greatly within Dogen society. Dogen religion is defined primarily through the worship of the ancestors and the spirits whom they encountered as they slowly migrated from their obscure ancestral homelands to the Bandiagra Cliffs. They were called the Namo. The Namo are ancestral spirits, sometimes referred to as deities, worshipped by the Dogen people of Mali. The word Namos is derived from a Dogen word meaning to make one drink. The Namos are usually described as amphibious hermaphroditic, fish-like creatures. Folk art depictions of the Namos show creatures with humanoid upper torsos, legs, feet, and a fish-like lower torso and tail. The Namos are also referred to as masters of the water, the monitors, and the teachers. Namo can be a proper name of an individual, or can refer to the group of spirits as a whole. The Namo are ancestral spirits, sometimes referred to as deities worshipped by the Dogen tribe of Mali. The word Namos is derived from a Dogen word meaning, to make one drink, they are usually described as amphibious, hermaphroditic, fish-like creatures. Folk art depictions of the Namos show creatures with humanoid upper torsos, legs, feet, and a fish-like lower torso and tail. The Namos are also referred to as masters of the water, 
the monitors, and the teachers. Dogen mythology states that Namo was the first living creature created by the sky god Amma. Shortly after his creation, Namo underwent a transformation and multiplied into four pairs of twins. One of the twins rebelled against the universal order created by Amma. To restore order to his creation, Amma sacrificed another of the Namo progeny, whose body was dismembered and scattered throughout the world. This dispersal of body parts is seen by the Dogen as the source for the proliferation of Bainu shrines throughout the Dogon's traditional territory, wherever a body part fell, a shrine was erected. The Namo allegedly descended from the sky in a vessel accompanied by fire and thunder. After arriving, the Namos created a reservoir of water and subsequently dove into the water. The Dogen legends state that the Namos required a watery environment in which to live. According to the myth related to Gryal and Diaturlan, the Namo divided his body among men to feed them, that is why it is also said that as the universe had drunk of his body, the Namo also made man drink. He gave all his life principles to human beings. The Namo was crucified on a tree, but was resurrected and returned to his home world. Dogen legend has it that he will return in the future to revisit the earth in a human form. The Dogen are famous for their astronomical knowledge taught through oral tradition, dating back thousands of years, referencing the binary star Sirius. In the latter part of the 1940s, French anthropologists Marcel Gryal and Germain Diaturlin, who had been working with the Dogen since 1931, confirming this theory. Their astronomical information begs the question, how did the Dogen come by this knowledge? Their oral traditions say it was given to them by the Namo. As the story goes, in the late 1930s, four Dogen priests shared their most important secret tradition with two French anthropologists, Marcel Gryal and Germain Diaturlin after they had spent an apprenticeship of 15 years living with the tribe. These were secret myths about the star Sirius, which is 8.6 light years from the Earth. The Dogen priests said that Sirius had a companion star that was invisible to the human eye. They also stated that the star moved in a 50-year elliptical orbit around Sirius, that it was small and incredibly heavy, and that it rotated on its axis. Initially the anthropologists wrote it off publishing the information in an obscure anthropological journal, because they didn't appreciate the astronomical importance of the information. What they didn't know was that since 1844, astronomers had suspected that Sirius A had a companion star. This was in part determined when it was observed that the path of the star wobbled. In 1862 Alvin Clark discovered the second star making Sirius a binary star system, two stars. In the 1920s it was determined that Sirius B, the companion of Sirius, was a white dwarf star. White dwarfs are small, dense stars that burn dimly. The pull of its gravity causes serious wavy movement. Sirius B is smaller than planet Earth. The Dogen name for Sirius B is Po Tolo. It means star, Tolo and smallest seed, Po. Seed refers to creation. In this case, perhaps human creation. By this name they describe the star's smallness. It is, they say, the smallest thing there is. They also claim that it is the heaviest star and is white in color. The Dogen thus attribute to Sirius B its three principal properties as a white dwarf, small, heavy, white star. The Awa Cult The Awa is a cult of the dead, whose purpose is to reorder the spiritual forces disturbed by the death of Namo, a mythological ancestor of great importance to the Dogen. Members of the Awo cult dance with ornate carved and painted masks during both funeral and death anniversary ceremonies. There are 78 different types of ritual masks among the Dogen and their iconographic messages go beyond the aesthetic, into the realm of religion and philosophy. The primary purpose of Awa dance ceremonies is to lead souls of the deceased to their final resting place in the family altars and to consecrate their passage to the ranks of the ancestors. The Lieb Cult The cult of Lieb, the Earth God, is primarily concerned with the agricultural cycle and its chief priest is called a Hogan. The Hogan is the spiritual and political leader of the village. 
he is elected from among the oldest men of the dominant lineage of the village. After his election, he has to follow a six-month initiation period, during which he is not allowed to shave or Washington he wears white clothes and nobody is allowed to touch him. A virgin who has not yet had her period takes care of him, cleans the house and prepares his meals. She returns to her home at night. After his initiation, he wears a red fez. He has an armband with a sacred pearl that symbolizes his function. The virgin is replaced by one of his wives, and she also, after his initiation, he wears a red fez. He has an armband with a sacred pearl that symbolizes his, cleans the house and prepares his meals. She returns to her home at night. After his initiation, he wears a red fez. He has an armband with a sacred pearl that symbolizes his function. The virgin is replaced by one of his wives, and she also returns to her home at night. The Hogong has to live alone in his house. The Dogen believe the sacred snake Lieb comes during the night to clean him and to transfer wisdom. All Dogen villages have a Lieb shrine whose altars have bits of earth and corp. Look at the name that they give him, right? The Hogong. I want you to remember that, the whole gun, and then it said what, a serpent comes at night and cleans Down him. in his house. The Dogen believe the sacred snake Lieb comes during the night to clean him and to transfer wisdom. All Dogen villages have a Lieb shrine who- Didn't we just go over the Asclepes, right? It was a snake that came and cleaned his ear and whispered into him the secrets. And uh, wasn't it a serpent that came and showed him the way to, uh, Bring back the dead. Oh, oh, oh boy, this is good. Altars have bits of earth incorporated into them to encourage the continued fertility of the land. According to Dogen beliefs, the god Lieb visits the Hogans every night in the form of a serpent and licks their skins in order to purify them and infuse them with life force. The Hogans are... That's the Greek stuff we just went over with the Sclapes. Oh my goodness responsible for guarding the purity of the soil and therefore officiate at many agricultural ceremonies. The Bainu Cult The cult of Bainu is a totemic practice and it has complex associations with the Dogen's sacred places used for ancestor worship, spirit communication and agricultural sacrifices. Marcel Grial and his colleagues came to believe that all the major Dogen sacred sites were related to episodes in the Dogen myth of the creation of the world, in particular to a deity named Namo. Bainu shrines house spirits of mythic ancestors who lived in the legendary era before the appearance of death among mankind. Bainu spirits often make themselves known to their descendants in the form of an animal that interceded on behalf of the clan during its founding or migration, thus becoming the clan's totem. The priests of each Bainu maintain the sanctuaries whose facades are often painted with graphic signs and mystic symbols. Sacrifices of blood and millet porridge the primary crop of the Dogen are made at the Bainu shrines at sowing time and whenever the intercession of the immortal ancestor is desired. I want to show you this. Edo, Japan, right? Here we go. Before the 10th century, there is no mention of Edo in historical records, but for a few settlements in the area. Edo first appears in the Azuma Kagami Chronicles. That name for the area being probably used since the second half of the Heian period. Its development started in the late 11th century with a branch of the Kanmu Taira clan, Huan Wu Ping Shi, called the Chichibu clan, Ji Fu Shi, coming from the banks of the then Iruma River, present-day upstream of Arakawa River. A descendant of the head of the Chichibu clan settled in the area and took the name Edo Shigetsugu, Zhonghu Zhongji, likely based on the name used for the place, and founded the Edo clan. Shigetsugu built a fortified residence, probably around the tip of the Musashino Terrace, which would become the Edo Castle, 
Shigetsugu's son, Edo Shigenaga, Zhang Hu Zhang Zhang, took the Taira's side against Minamoto no Yoritomo in 1180, but eventually surrendered to Minamoto and became a Gokenin for the Kamakura Sogonate. At the fall of the Sogonate in the 14th century, the Edo clan took the side of the southern court, and its influence <coughs> declined during the Muromachi period. In 1456, a vassal of the Ogigayatsu branch of the Uesugi clan started to build a castle on the former fortified residence of the Edo clan and took the name Oda Dokin. Dokin lived in this castle until his assassination in 1486. Under Dokin, with good water connections to Kamakura, Odawara and other parts of Kanto and the country, Edo expanded in a Jakamachi. With the castle bordering a cove opening into Edo Bay, current Hibia Park, and the town developing along the Hirakawa River that was flowing into the cove, as well as the stretch of land on the eastern side of the cove, roughly where current Tokyo Station is, called Edomato, Zhang Hu Qian Dao. Some priests and scholars fleeing Kyoto after the Onan War came to Edo during that period. After the death of Dokin, the castle became one of the strongholds of the Uesugi clan, which fell to the later Hojo clan at the Battle of Takanawahara in 1524, during the expansion of their rule over the Kanto area. When the Hojo clan was finally defeated by Toyotomi Hideyoshi in 1590, the Kanto area was given to rule to Toyotomi's senior officer Tokugawa Ieyasu, who took his residence in Ed. Alright, so, I want to show you this. Now look at that. The Midwestern region was a division of Nigeria from 1963 to 1991, formerly known as Bendel State from 1976. It was formed in June 1963 from Benin and Delta provinces of the Western region. And its capital was Benin City. 21, it was renamed a province in 1966, and in 1967 when the other provinces were split up into several states, it remained territorially intact. Becoming a state. 22, during the Nigerian Civil War, the Biafran forces invaded the new Midwestern state, en route to Lagos, in an attempt to force a quick end to the war. While under Biafran occupation, the state was declared as the Republic of Benin as Nigerian forces were to retake the region. 23. The Republic collapsed a day after the declaration as Nigerian troops overtook Benin City. Edo State was established on 27 August 1991 when Bendel State was split into Edo and Delta States. 24. 25. Look at this flag. It's the reversal of the Japanese flag, in my opinion. You have the white for the Japanese. The whole flag is white with the red sun. Here you have half white, half red. And the center is clear. I think, again, the Benin, you know, these people were switched. I think that they went from being where they should have been in Asia, in Japan, and they were placed in Africa. <laughs>